we mentioned this morning that the next two Thursday nights we will not be having services here. And because of, probably because of New Year's Eve, I don't imagine the ladies' prayer meeting will be meeting at Wednesday, night, Wednesday morning, although if you want to meet, that's up to you. All right, let's go back to John 17 again. <clears throat> Several have asked about my wife. She went down to uh, see our son graduate yesterday from college, and she'd be back tomorrow night, so... John chapter 17, we were over in the 10th verse this morning, and then went through the 11th verse, where the Lord prayed that the Father would keep us, and that would keep his believers together. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those whom thou gavest me have I kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Do you know who the son of perdition is? It's Judas. Over in one of the Gospels, Jesus said, Have not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil, a demon. <clears throat> Judas was one who never came to a real saving faith in Christ. He knew all about the Lord. He's the perfect example of a fellow who traveled in the best of company, heard the best teaching there was to hear. He participated in all kinds of religious activities. He was in the company that went out casting out demons. And he was exposed to all these good things. And yet, it says, haven't I chosen you twelve and one of you is a demon? And by the way, none of the disciples knew which one it was. That's pretty slick. Only Jesus and Judas knew who it was. And, you know, one of the things that... <laughs> you get to thinking sometimes, there's so many bad apples in the church, you know. My, my, my. So many stinkers turn up in the church. Well, I don't know if it's too bad or not. Jesus, chose, Jesus was a perfect leader. He chose 12. One of them was a demon. One twelve, One out of 12? That's pretty regular, isn't it? Now, don't start counting. One, two, three, four. Twelve. There's the twelfth one. <laughs> but uh, it is true that ever since the beginning, the enemy has been within the camp. But one thing that that tells us is that nothing can stop the onward progress of what Jesus is doing in the world. Amen? It never has stopped the church yet. It won't stop it now. Nothing the enemy has ever been able to do has been able to stop the onward marching of God's glorious program. I'm glad I'm in the winning side. Aren't you? Aren't you on the winning side? Amen. It may not look like it sometimes. I may not talk like it sometimes. I may not even act like it sometimes, but I'm on the winning side. He said, when I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those you gave me, I kept. And none of them is lost, but the one who never was saved. Son of perdition. That scripture might be fulfilled. By the way, it's an interesting thing. Now, this is just a speculation. Please let me make clear. This is speculation. This is not, thus saith the Lord, this is a revelation straight from the glory. But this is an interesting thought. There are about three or four verses, three or four, this is one of them, in the scripture that you can build a fairly good speculating case that Antichrist will be Judas resurrected. Uh, this scripture where he's called the son of perdition, another scripture where Jesus says of him after he died, or that he went to his own place, or the scripture says of him that Judas went to his own place, as if there was a special place for him. And then another one, um, it talks about the Antichrist coming against the God of his fathers, indicating that he comes out of the Jewish nation. And Judas was the only 
Judite and the whole bunch. He was the only one from the king, clinging tribe of Judah. The other disciples were from other tribes. And he was the only Judite in the bunch. Kind of interesting. Chase it down sometime if you want to tangle your brain with something. Uh, and another interesting thing is, that back oh, about 100 years ago when I was in school, back in those olden days, uh, I remember that in seminary, especially the, the professors called attention to the fact that there was such a tremendous move on among the liberal scholars, those who are discounting the scriptures heavily, to make apologies for Judas and to say he was terribly misunderstood. He was really a hero. What he was really trying to do was force Jesus to reveal himself as king so he could set the kingdom up right then. And he was terribly misunderstood. And the reason Judas betrayed him was in order to force Jesus' hand and make him identify himself as the king sent from heaven. He said, well, that does not what the scripture said. I know, but you know, when you just throw the scriptures away, you can decide anything you want. And especially if you want to whitewash the traitor, you can do that. If you remember when Jesus Christ Superstar came along, that abomination of blasphemy, um, you remember Judas, if you know anything about the storyline of that thing, uh, and a lot of people who saw that had, were not acquainted with the scripture, so they, they, couldn't, they couldn't begin to put it together. But Judas was a brilliant, clever, and exceedingly wise person in that Jesus Christ Superstar. Jesus was sort of a bumbling idiot who had to be guided by Judas. And all the others were dumb except Judas. And he, he came out really sparkling. He was really nice. Nice guy. And you'd expect the devil to try to polish him up before he presented him, wouldn't you? And the theologians polishing him up and saying he was terribly misunderstood. He really was simply trying to get Jesus to do what he ought to have done all the time. And if the devil happened to pop him on the scene and say, here he is back, this is living proof that he was misunderstood. He's one of the 12 apostles. Well, my land, you got popes over in Rome claiming to be descendants of the apostles, and they bow down and kiss their toes and everything else. What would you have if you had a living apostle raised up? One of the 12. Hmm? Interesting. Not necessarily so, but Interesting. Don't get carried away with it, but I thought you might like something to tease your brain with a little bit. Do some Bible study. I thought it was interesting. One thing about it, the Antichrist, when he comes, will come with power, strength. By the way, when you're dealing with the spirit of Antichrist, always bind the power, the spirits of power and strength, because Daniel said Antichrist, when he comes, will come with power and strength. He always comes with those two spirits accompanying him. We learned that early in the deliverance ministry. Now, none of these was lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. You know, Jesus went to great lengths to fulfill the scripture. You remember when he said, I thirst? It said, I thir he said, I thirst that the scriptures be fulfilled. They parted his garment among them, cast lots on his garment, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. All these scriptures had to be fulfilled exactly. And nothing has been more thoroughly documented than the facts concerning Jesus' death and resurrection according to the scriptures. <clears throat> and now he says, I come to thee. He's looking forward now. He's, remember, he's going back to the Father soon. And these things I speak in the world that they, now he's talking about those he's kept out of the world, in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled, fill full, where? In the world? No, where? In themselves. You're not going to have your joy fulfilled in the world. The joy of the Lord is going to be fulfilled in you. You're going to be able to live in the world in spite of, of the circumstances around you, not necessarily because of them, because circumstances will change. But his joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And you see, the joy of the Lord is not dependent on outside circumstances at all. It has nothing to do with those. Happiness is, is geared to your circumstances. If I feel good, I'm happy. I had a big turkey dinner. 
I feel happy. I've got indigestion. I feel unhappy. Hmm. See, my circumstances change and my happiness is directly affected by it. I have a new car. I'm happy. Somebody ran into it with a 10-ton truck and totaled it. I'm unhappy. See, my happiness is geared to the circumstances and the things around me. But the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, springs up from within. And Jesus said, I want my joy fulfilled in them. And he said, I'm speaking these things in the world so that my joy could be brought to fulfillment in themselves. I have given them much money. Cars, houses, lands, fame, popularity. No, what has he given them? I've given them thy word. And the world has loved them and said, Hooray, here they come again. That sweet little old Christian bunch. I'm so glad they came back. How wonderful. Open your doors, everybody, and beat the drums and get the crowd together because they've come to help us and bless us again. Whoopee. No, it said the world has hated them. I gave them thy word, and the world has hated them. And here you thought there was something wrong with you. No, if he's given you his word, the world reacts to that without you saying anything. They know. Because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world, they recognize you don't fit. And you shouldn't fit. Hmm? They're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. See, Jesus never did fit in either. He always aggravated the daylights out of all the religious folks he met. He irritated and embarrassed them every time he turned around. And he didn't have to do anything to do that, just walking around. He caused all kinds of trouble. When he started giving out the word of the Father, it made the upset worse. Verse 15 said, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world. Oh, dear. Do you ever say, oh, Lord, get me through this day and then just take me home to heaven? Or, Lord, let's just interrupt this day. Let's go on and quit. Let's, I'm ready to go. Let's go now. Hmm? You ever tell the Lord that? You felt like it sometimes, haven't you? I'm just tired of this old world. It's just not worth it. Oh, pfft. I'm so tired of problems. I'm so tired of um, misunderstandings. I'm so tired of this. I'm tired of that. I want to go home. And Jesus sweetly says, I don't pray that you'll take them out of the world, Father. Ooh, come on, Lord. He said, the world's going to hate you. And he knew what happened. We'd say, take us out, take us out, get us out of here. He says, I don't pray, Father, that you take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. And if I remember right, the Greek says the evil one. Keep them from the evil. He wants us to be able to stay and stand in the face of this evil world that we're in. The face of all its hatred and ridicule. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Now when you begin to understand this, you'll understand some of the hatred that's directed against you. Sanctify them through thy truth. Now sanctify means to set apart. Set them apart through thy truth. What is truth? Thy word is truth. That's why we have to be people of the word, people of the book. Because we're to be set aside in truth. And his word is the truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I've told them to come on home, they don't have to go out there. That's what we like sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> No, he said, even if you sent me out in the world, so I've sent them out in the world. That's why you're out there. That's why you're out there in this dark. You say, but you don't understand. There's nobody at my, where I work. Nobody in the block where I live. I think everybody belongs to the devil where I work and where I live. Is that so? Isn't that nice? God put a little, little shining light right there in the middle of all that darkness. 
And guess what? If you're the only one, you're the only one they get to shoot at. You say, well, thanks a lot. That's awful encouraging. But you see, that's where lights are for. Lights are for the dark places. They're not for places full of light. You don't put lights where there's already a cluster of lights. You take lights and put them in the dark places, don't you? And you say, well, I don't know. That sounds so hard. Well, you know, if you came into a place where there was a lot of light, for instance, if I had a match, suppose I had a match, that's a real bright light, isn't it? You'd hardly be able to see it up here, would you? Because all these lights would outshine it, wouldn't they? But suppose I go back in the back room where there's no light at all. Then that little light is an awful big light because it's the only one around. That's why God puts you out in the dark places. Then he brings you together where there's a lot of light. And then he sends you out where there's not any light. His lamps are we to shine where he shall say, and lamps are not for sunny rooms nor for the light of day, but for the dark places of the earth where sin and wrong and crime have birth. That's where God puts his lamps. That's us. That's why you're out there in that dark spot, to give light. You say, I'm tired of giving light. Well, just get over being tired because that's our, that's our destiny, to be his lights. And he said, and for their sakes, for the sakes of his followers, I sanctify, I set apart myself, that they might be also set apart through the truth. Jesus said, I set myself aside and apart so that they can be set apart through the truth. Now here's your key verse right here. Verse 20. He said, well, that's fine. He's praying about those disciples he had, and that's nice. I live Hundreds of years later, how about me? Verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, through the word of these early believers. He said, I pray for all those that are going to be. Did you believe because of John's word, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Paul? Hmm? That's what caused you to believe, wasn't it? Remember, you came because of hearing the word of God. And that's what brought you to Christ. And so guess what? Jesus prayed for you because he said, I'm going to pray for every one of those who will come to be a believer because they hear the words of these that I'm praying for right now. I'm praying for these others also. So he prayed for me. If you ever think nobody's praying for you, go to the 17th chapter of John and nail her down that he's praying for you. Now notice what he prays, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee. They also shall be one in us, that the world may believe thou hast sent me. The unity of the believers will be a witness to the world of the power of God. Unfortunately, religious folks have taken these verses over and over again and tried to make the believers become one can't be done you don't make them be one it's an operation of the Holy Spirit the Father and the Son that causes believers to be one they're the only ones that can put them together you can tie them together all you want to and they won't be one unless the Holy Spirit's done it you can take a tomcat's tail and tie it to a bulldog's tail and you've got union they're tied together but there is no unity they don't like each other and they will fight. They'd be better for the tomcat to go his way and the bulldog to go his way because tied together they will fight until one of them kills the other. And some people are trying to tie people together thinking they're bringing unity. It isn't done that way, people. It's not done with organizations. It's done by the Holy Spirit moving in and through his believers. And that's why so many people come here from all kinds of cultures and churches and everything else and they feel at home here because of the Spirit that's moving here, because the Holy Spirit is moving here, and they feel at home if they're tuned into the Holy Spirit, they feel at home. You say, well, I don't feel at home here. Well, guess what? You want me to diagnose your case? There's a reason why you don't feel comfortable, because the Holy Spirit is moving among the believers here. And it's not an exclusive thing. You can be part of it too. It doesn't matter what nationality you belong to. It doesn't matter what church you belong to. If you belong to Jesus, you'll fit right in here. Simply because 
It's a unity that's been created by the believing in the word of God and believing Jesus and what he says. <clears throat> and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. He said, when I bring them together in this unity through the Holy Spirit and through the Father and through the Son, he said, then the glory you gave me, I will give to them. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect or mature, complete in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. The unity of the believers has always been done through history a witness to an unsaved world of the power of God. So would you understand that the devil works ceaselessly and tirelessly to cause dissension and trouble, misunderstanding, and splits and splinters, schisms and schisms and spasms and everything else to come into the fellowships to tear them up because he doesn't want that unity to be seen by the world. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me. <clears throat> Have you been given to the Father? By the Father to the Son? Hmm? He's talking about you, so perk up and listen now. I will that they also, the ones sitting here, that thou hast given me, look what he says, I will, this is my will, Father, that they be with me where I am. How about that? Where is he? Third heaven. He said, I will that they be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Are you going to get to see Jesus' glory? You bet. Because he wills. He told the Father, I will that they be with me. Do you think the Savior's will is going to be met by the Father? He was the perfectly obedient Son. And everything the Father has, he said, I've given to the Son. And he loves to give to his son, his obedient son, what the son asks. And one of the things he asks is that they be with me and they be able to behold my glory, which thou hast given me. He said, I want them to see me as I am. You realize you've just caught a glimpse of Jesus dimly, slightly, just a flash, a flicker here and there. The brightest understanding we've had of the Lord is just dim compared to the full revelation of his glory. <clears throat> and he said, I want them to be with me where I am. Now the next time the devil says, you're not worth anything. Whatever gave you any idea that you were worth anything. Who'd want you? Just say Jesus would. He said, I'm accepted in the beloved. And he prayed to the Father about me. And you may not think I'm much and I don't even think too much of myself. But Jesus died for me and he ransomed me and he prayed for his father to see to it that I got to be with him where he is and that I'm going to look on his glory. He said that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. He said I want them to see me in all my glory. Now remember this. Over in the first chapter of John, of Revelation, John saw Jesus like this. Remember now, John had walked with him for, over, for three years or so, had been with him when he did the miracles, had seen him raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out devils, work all kinds of miracles, supernatural wonders, seen him walk on the water. John had been with him, had seen him transfigured up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were there. John had seen all this. And yet, when he was caught away to the third heaven in the first chapter of Revelation, and he saw Jesus, he said, I fell at his feet as one dead. Boom. The glory of the unveiled Christ knocked him flat. And yet he had seen him. He saw him all during his ministry. He saw him on the cross. He saw him after he was risen from the dead. He saw all of these things. And yet when he saw him in the third heaven, 
he was just flattened by it. It knocked him for a loop, literally. And Jesus said, I want them to see me with the glory that you had, you gave me before the world ever was. And friend, we're heading for glory times. Keep your mind on that every once in a while because every once in a while it gets so dark down here, you forget there's any glory anywhere. I mean, it looks like the devil's run off with the ball and he's hidden and he changes the rules and everything else. And it looks like everybody's going the wrong way and nobody understands. And you're all by yourself. That's okay. It's going to straighten out one of these days because we're going to be caught away to see him in his glory. We're going to see him as he is in his glory. And when we do, it's going to be a breathtaking sight. You know that? It's going to be something else. You say, well, how can we stand it? Well, it's not, we're going to have a new body. It's going to take a new body to stand heaven. Do you realize that your body that you're in now couldn't stand heaven? It'd be like taking an engine out of a 747 and hooking it into one of these little two-passenger planes over here. Well, that little plane couldn't even hold that engine, let alone, and when you cranked it up, it'd tear it all to pieces. That little plane is not built for such power. Let me tell you something. This body's not built for what's coming. This body was built for this time in which we live. And Jesus bought us a new body on the cross. You say, well, I better start praying about it. Well, not necessary. Unless you just want to thank the Lord for it before you get it. Because it's already bought and paid for. You don't have to... You don't have to do anything for it. When he died on the cross, rose from the grave, he bought you a new body. He bought me a new body. Mine's going to be so thin when I turn sideways, you won't even see me. (laughs) But uh, he bought you a new body without sin under salvation. It's going to be completely, and you're going to look in vain to find a single spot on it. All those old spots and wrinkles are going to be gone. You say, how could it be? How could it be? I scrubbed, I worked, I wept, I cried, I tried the best I could. And Jesus said, I finished the job. We swapped that old one in on a new one. And this new one is all ready to go. And he's just going to drop your soul and spirit into that new body and you'll be all fixed. Now, we don't know a whole lot about that new body. Uh, Only thing we know, we're going to have a body like unto his. And we still don't know a whole lot about it, except he could, he could be in Emmaus one moment, and then zoop, he'd be gone, he'd be someplace else. Quick as you could think, he'd move. He could walk through the door without opening it. Remember when the disciples were all alone, and Thomas, they were telling Thomas, we saw, we saw him. And he said, well, I'm sorry, folks. You know, I'm just sort of the fellow that I have to see it. I, I, I think you boys, I think you're sincere. I think it's nice that you're so sincere, but... You know, we've all been pretty wrought up. And uh, before I could believe, now I'd have to put my hands in those nail prints. I saw, I saw those nails. And I'd have to thrust my hand up in that side there where that wound is before I could believe. And without opening the door or anything else, Jesus stood in the midst. Now he had a new body. And yet it looked like that other one. It was enough because Thomas knew him. And he said, hello, Thomas. Here's my hands. Uh, here, here's my side. Go ahead. Did you know that it's not recorded that Thomas touched him at all? He said, my Lord and my God. He didn't need near as much bracing up as he thought he would. He believed. And don't you be a Thomas. Don't you be missing when the glory comes down. Thomas missed out when the disciples first met Jesus coming back. He is busy. He probably had to do something important. And he missed out. And when he came back, there was all a buzz. And we saw the Lord. We saw the when, when. Well, you didn't come to the meeting. Well, I had this I had to tend to. Well, I know, but oh, oh, did you miss it? You missed it. (gasps) Oh, we saw him. We saw him. You know, Mary Magdalene, they told us, and we just couldn't believe it. But it's real, Thomas. And he said, now, look. 
let's just drive a peg down here. I'd have to see it myself. I just, old Doubting Thomas, they call him. Don't be too hard on him, though. I remember when Jesus was talking about dying, Thomas said, let's all go with him so we can die with him. He wasn't a little shrinking violent by a long shot. But he was temporarily shaken. He was out of, out of place when Jesus first came, which teaches us a valuable lesson. You be where God wants you to be. You're just liable to miss out when God starts moving in marvelous ways. Now, these new bodies are going to be something else. And they'll be built for heaven. We'll be able to get around. We're not going to get tired anymore. Did you ever come in at the end of the day? Oh, I'm just dead. Never going to get tired. You're never going to have any needs that you have now. These new bodies are going to be something else. And we don't know a great deal about them, except they're going to be far superior to these. You'll be able to get around quite a bit faster, too. And you'll never grow old, never get sick. And when I'm telling the children about heaven, by the way, when you're, I think I've mentioned this to you before. If you're talking to your children about Jesus and about salvation, the biggest attraction for children about salvation is going to heaven. Did you know that? That's why Jesus talked a lot about it. Little children are attracted to heaven. And so you tell them about heaven, God's beautiful home. Well, just think about it. There's no night there. And there never has been a kid that won't go to bed. <clears throat> I don't think. Mm -hmm. And there's no night there. And uh, there's no need of the sun because Jesus is the light and fills the whole place. And nobody ever gets sick so there's never any old nasty medicine or shots because nobody ever gets sick. And there's no graveyards because nobody ever dies. Hmm? There's no sin at all. It's all gone. Everything is spotless clean. And you know, above everything else, you boys and girls out there, did you know that God wants you to come and live in his beautiful home one of these days? Of course, you have to be careful now when you're dealing with children. I think I told you this before about a group where somebody was, this man was telling all about heaven and how beautiful it was, and finally he got to the climax and said, how many of you boys and girls would like to go to heaven? Let's see your hands. And boy, every hand went up except one little boy down in the front. Everybody was into, all the kids were enthusiastic. Sure, they wanted to go. And he said, don't you want to go to heaven? He, he said, When? He said, well, someday. He said, oh, I thought you was making up a load yeah, now. I'm, I'm just... <laughs> but um, God wants you to go, come and live in heaven with him. And then you give him the clincher, but you can't go. Because one thing that's not allowed in heaven is dark hearts. And our hearts are dark with sin. And sin is when you do bad things. Now, for children, when you're dealing with children, put sin down on their level where they understand it. Sin is breaking God's law. Well, now, what, what law do children break? Don't talk to them about adultery. It's doubtful that they have been out there. <clears throat> they probably haven't even gotten drunk. Uh, but talk to the child about lying. Did you ever tell a lie? And I've had children look at me. <laughs> and then I say, well, did you ever tell something that wasn't just exactly the truth? <laughs> See, the Bible says, thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And so that's sin. That makes your heart dark. Okay. And then, uh, did you ever steal anything? Oh, no child ever did that. But did you ever take something that wasn't yours? Oh, yes. Did you ever take a toy or something? Oh, yes. You see, 
you have to help them to see. Or if you're supposing mommy, mommy said, who pulled this cookie jar off and broke it? And you said, I don't know, but you did. Hmm? Well, you'd be surprised. Children can be very deeply convicted of sin, in, especially in those two areas, in lying and stealing. And that's all you need is a conviction for sin that they have, can understand. But if you ask Jesus to come in your heart and forgive you, then he'll give you a clean heart. And clean hearts can go to heaven. And they can go and live with in God's beautiful home someday. Someday I, I don't think I've still got a start I bring my frontal board and do a flannel board story for you. Show you how to teach children. One of the most fascinating, most rewarding things is to lead children to the Lord. They are so open to the gospel. You remember, Alice, when we used to have the wordless books? We made up a bunch of the wordless books. I made them at school and passed them out and showed you how to use them. Yeah, you had a little wordless book. It has four pages that are different colors. You can take that little book without any words or anything. It's called the wordless book, and you can lead a child right to the Lord using that little book. And all you have to know is about three, three Bible verses. And it'll work. Well, clean hearts can go to heaven. Aren't you glad? And Jesus is the one that makes us able to go and live in heaven with him. Well, he said, O righteous Father, verse 25, The world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be where? In them and I in them. In other words, this marvelous love is to be poured out in the believers. Not only to save them, but to reach out to others. What a marvelous prospect we have to fulfill our destiny of being his lights. Huh? If you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, if you've got a dirty heart and you can't go to heaven, wouldn't you like to get it cleaned up tonight? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this, you can ask the Lord to come in your heart tonight. You can pray something like this, Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you here and now to come into my heart and save me from all my sins. Now, you boys and girls out there, did you know you can lead your friends to the Lord using the same thing that I'm talking about? This is very simple. That's very basic, and you can lead little people to the Lord, and you can lead big people to the Lord the same way. Everybody has to come through this same little gate, and salvation's gate, even a child can open it. Because Jesus said, if you'll open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done it, but you want to, you can do it tonight. If you can't get, be sure about it, don't hesitate to come forward when the invitation starts, and just... Say, I won't talk to somebody about salvation. That's all you have to say. And somebody will sit down and go over the plan of salvation with you to see if you're resting firmly in what Jesus said. Now, if that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior which slows down, stops, or reverses spiritual growth and progress. Of course, you're talking about demonic working in your life, and they must be cast out. These signs shall follow them that believe, and my name shall they cast out devils. Speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This is the whole gospel. Salvation, deliverance, and healing. We believe all of it, along with the charismatic gifts. And we minister in all these areas. If you need help, don't hesitate to come and avail yourself of the fact that this is really a full gospel church. The whole thing. Let's stand. Sing something about that name <clears throat> as we do. If you have a need, come down the center aisle. If you're a first-timer coming from...